I don't watch anime. I'd even go as far as to say that I don't even like anime. I mean, I've seen anime when I was younger, and I look back fondly on some of it, and there are even others that have come out recently I can admit that I had a pretty good time with. But those are the exceptions to the rule. For the most part, anime, it ain't for me. So I've noticed that I'm in a unique power position of being able to look at an anime, and if I think it's good, then that's gotta be a ringing endorsement. I'm not saying my opinion is intrinsically correct, but it's just if something like this wins me over, that's really something for me. And if I don't like a show you like, and you don't think I'm at least entertaining about it, then, well, it's the internet. You get to attack my character brutally with no consequences. But I also think there might be a phenomenon in this subculture, where the little 90-second music videos that play before every episode can sometimes be such heaters and so visually compelling that they can sometimes trick people into thinking a show is better than it is. Because no matter how much I don't care for anime in general, I can admit often the openings go fucking crazy. So I ask you this, did you like Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, or was the opening just good? First off, we gotta get some things out of the way, have I seen this before? I've seen maybe three quarters of it a while ago, I barely remember anything, but I did technically watch the episodes. The light from them hit my retinas. But there's some really important shit in my brain, bro, stuff I need, so maybe they just got filtered out, I don't know. There are going to be random spoilers in this, by the way, because of that, so... The things I do remember, I remember one of the people turns into a big green monster, there's also another guy digging a tunnel, and I think that's about it. And we're only talking about the first 14 episodes. Why? Because that's the number of episodes that the first opening covers. You may have been tricked into liking the show by the second opening, but that's not what we're talking about today. That's not for me to say. So anyway, finally, the review. Okay, so the opening. Right out the gate, I think, probably has to be one of the more beloved ones, if I'm reading the room right. I still don't know what the hell this thing is, but I assume it's gotta be pretty important since it's the first thing you see in the entire show. But yeah, anyway, obviously the opening's pretty good. Usually in an anime opening, at least for a show like this, I'm looking for something with a little more intensity, something to get the blood pumping. And it does get there briefly, but honestly, these first 14 episodes aren't a lot of that kind of stuff anyway. So I think it's kind of appropriate. I also like this little beat of Edward seemingly reaching out for his mother in this first shot, and then the comparison of him doing the same motion only a few shots later, but as if he's going to fight someone. And fight who? It's his bastard of a father, of course. Cool little detail. The first handful of shots cover their backstory that just sounds like they're trying to one-up someone else with their sad past. Our dad left us when we were like seven, and then our mom got plagued into the ground. Oh yeah, and then I became a double amputee, and my brother was also amputated too. All of them. He was amputated. Yeah, and on top of all that, our fucking house burned down. Like, okay, man, I get it. Your backstory is tragic. Jesus Christ. Of course, we get our anime standard, a bunch of the secondary characters doing one quick motion, either denoting their power or their personality, or if you're really lucky, sometimes you can get away with both. At least the cast isn't so staggeringly large at the moment that they can't even get away with that, so thank you. My only two real critiques of this whole opening are, one, the shot of Edward running forward, and I don't know, just looks a bit goofy to me, not quite at home with the quality of the rest of the opening. And this hilarious shot where Edward gets two limbs blasted off brutally, changing his body for life. Alphonse is annihilated from the physical plane entirely, and Winry gets, like, a light to medium jostling. She's like, whoa! I get that it's supposed to be probably her emotional turmoil with the whole thing, she's had a rough time too, but in the face of having to take your shoe off to count to ten, and being erased, not even a corpse to bury, it's just a little funny to me. Overall though, I like the music and the visual pair nicely, and this explosion looks really good. I get why you like the opening. But now the show, what we're really talking about. Oh wait, subbed or dubbed? Oh, Dub just gets their very close battle. I know some anime purists out there are gonna be like, he watched Dubbed, he's a fake fan, and one, you're correct, but two, I feel like if I watch Dub, it's at least something I can comment on rather than it being in Japanese. I don't know if these guys are giving a good performance. I don't even know if they're saying what the subtitles say. This show could be about something entirely different as far as I know. And I don't have a Duolingo sponsorship, so whoever thinks I'm learning Japanese at age 55, you can all go to hell. I swear though, if this ever lands on Subbed, I'll do it and even make an ass of myself by trying to talk about the performances. Okay, now finally, the real show, 14 episodes. I have praise and I have criticism, don't you worry about that. Let's talk about the writing. For the most part, I think overall it's pretty strong. I like the slow bleed of information. Very much in episode one, we're just thrown into a situation. There's an evil ice man, he fucks hard. He's doing some grand scale thing to destroy a city. Good, let me in there, I love it. How does this magic work? I don't know, there's some circles you need, except you totally don't. Like there's Edward and his teacher that don't need the circles, but you can also 
also just have a circle tattooed on your hand, or wear gloves, or I assume have a tattoo anywhere on your body, or wear a cool jacket or shoes with circles on them. Anyway, not the point. We'll circle back around to that. We have our two young protagonists, Edward and Alphonse, and they already have a reputation to upkeep. I love it. Trust me, I love a good coming of age, finding yourself, and finding your power story. But when a character starts the story and they're already formidable, I think that's a very often unused choice, and it's a lot of fun. So we're starting with Aces here. The show's ahead, and the first episode starts the lovely little slow bleed of info I think this show does so well. It shows the magic system is diverse, applicable in a ton of situations, and you can be clever with it. It shows there's some unrest for unknown reasons in the military for what the country is doing or has already done. Very interesting. It keeps cutting to this bring me the horizon motherfucker sitting in a jail cell for no reason doing an evil voice. And it ends the episode with a lovely little teaser of more important villains to come. Great. This first episode really isn't even anything. It doesn't really set any plot in motion. It just puts a bunch of interesting shit in front of you and makes you ask questions about it. Which is a pretty cool approach to an opening episode. There's of course pros and cons, but it's like when your English teacher used to tell you you have to grab your reader with your first sentence. They just took that idea and dedicated a whole episode to it. Good idea too, because I am interested. But you can't just show interesting stuff in your show and not have someone your audience cares about to frame it around, and that's where Edward and Alphonse come in. Alphonse, it's like a cheat code. You've got this little kid sounding voice, very timid, almost constantly frightened sounding in this giant hulking suit of armor. It's like, how are you not instantly endeared to that? Edward's a bit different in this first episode. I don't think he really jumps out at you as much as you want in an opening episode. He's very competent and cool and everyone talks a big game about him, like I said, but other than that, he just seems like a polite, discerning young man. Not quite iconic main character material just yet. But that does change as things go on. I really start to like Edward as we move forward. While polite and discerning, yes, he's also incredibly driven, morally stalwart, and meaningfully selfless. And what I mean by that is that the two always talk about getting their bodies back to normal, and I'm sure while Edward getting his limbs back would be a killer bonus for him, you get the feeling nearly every time it's brought up, Edward is only really talking about getting Alphonse's body back. Which I think makes for a great hero, a giant goal with mostly selfless intentions. I also think it's a cool beat that Edward is very skeptical about any kind of religion, because that thing he met claimed to be God, so praying to whatever that was doesn't seem like something he'd ever care to do. I'm afraid though, the show hasn't used him as effectively as I'd like so far. I know, I know, it probably changes later, but in these first 14 episodes, it's a lot of studying, or being laid up from injuries, or flashing back to their childhoods, or being in a mechanical village where they just don't get to do anything, we'll get to that. In the moments where Edward gets to be active and be cool and smart, I think he's great. The show even goes out of its way to show that he's very intelligent, which goes hand in hand with the magic system. He basically has to be smart to do any of this in the first place, which I think is a great choice. And actually, now that I mention it, let's talk about the magic system for a moment. While I do think it's cool, I think explained or at least healthily implied limitations in a magic system is very important. And you should think with a show that literally starts with a dictionary definition of how the magic works, we should be good. You take one thing, use its chemical and physical makeup to make another thing. It makes perfect sense. I get it. That's why when they took 20 pounds of carbon and some limestone and a few pipe cleaners or whatever to try and conjure their mom, it made sense. That's why when he makes a spear out of the floor, it makes sense. He's just changing the shape of the material that was already there. I like it. But here's where I get confused. So it's all about creating something from something else. That's what alchemy is. So so where in the alchemy handbook is throwing fireballs outlined, or just mostly earthbending on massive scales like Edward seems to have made his go-to moves, or turning water to ice or steam? Okay, well maybe that would make more sense because there's like a physical state change there, but you get what I'm saying. I'm still ignorant to a lot of the series of course, but I'm just not sure where the law of equivalent exchange really applies to making building sized earth pillars over and over. I'll willingly eat crow if someone can explain it to me, or the giant fireballs. Anyway, back to Edward, I think his voice actor has a pretty great range. He can capture a lot of subtle emotion in his line reads, which seems important for who Edward is at the moment. I had this thought about halfway through the season where there's that really sort of goofy scene I felt where Winry cries for him, and I'm not sure if the feeling I get from that scene is if it's Edward has used up all the tears he has for that situation with his mom, or if he just isn't letting himself feel that end of his emotional spectrum anymore. And I think it would be much more interesting if it was the latter. I don't know at all, of course, if this is part of any arc he has, but it seems like Edward holds himself to the standards of your classic macho man. He wants to be big and strong. He wants to be stoic and put on a brave face for his loved ones and lead them through the dark. Which makes sense. The two people he's closest to are his little brother and a girl he's probably gonna end up liking. And while all those qualities are admirable, they also have an unhealthy side if committed to too strongly of not letting yourself be truly human. Feeling what you feel, letting people help you. There's even the shot in the very next episode. Like it's framed like it looks like he's going to cry. You would think that would be the point of this shot, but he doesn't. And I find that very interesting. I think it would be a wonderful, 
noble, often unexplored arc for Edward if he held these values now, and over the course of the show, grew to have a healthier idea of what it is to be a man. Whether it be through his emotions, or even though it's constantly played for a joke, his height. I hope it goes that way, if not, the show can still be good, obviously. Speaking of jokes though, we gotta talk about this. What the fuck is going on guys? There are three jokes in this show, maybe three and a half if you're being generous. Joke one, someone calls Edward short and he gets really, really mad. Joke two, someone mistakes Alphonse for the Full Metal Alchemist and Edward gets really, really mad. Joke three, someone does some really over the top anime shit and everyone is very shocked or starts yelling in surprise. Joke point five, the characters are drawn in their very low detailed chibi forms. This joke is often applied as a combo to jokes one through three and that's it. These three jokes are repeated episode in, episode out, ad nauseum. And I get that, okay, it's a fun shonen anime, have some goofy moments. Even if you don't have some really sharp comedic writing, it's not all that annoying. What I find troublesome is that there's some real tonal whiplash with some of them though. Like we can go from being in a really rather tense, serious scene to doing one of these three jokes not 10 seconds later. For example, remember that scene where there's a girl that's been brainwashed by the church that has just been ordered by the priest to shoot our main characters? And you're kind of like, holy fuck, this is something. And then less than a minute later, still pretty adjacent to that exact situation and it's like oh never mind we're goofy again there was one singular scene that actually used a combination of these jokes that i found funny though in episode eight beside that though the tonal whiplash is very present mostly in the first half of the season though as it went on i found the tone tended to stay more serious which i definitely preferred and i think that's where the show does its best work when it's taking itself more seriously i know it's target demographic and everything which i'm certainly not in so maybe throw this entire video in the dumpster but i do genuinely think when the show slows down and has moments that don't have to be overshadowed by forced anime comedy, it really shines. There are moments in the show that are just meaningfully quiet, and sometimes they're not long, but just those little scenes can pack a big punch, and I welcome them whenever they show up. The show also benefits from the protagonist's backstories being laid out over the course of multiple episodes. We get a look at them when their terrible event happens, and then we move on, and a few episodes later we learn about what their home life was like, and their dad, and then a few more episodes down the line we learn about their training and why they're so good. And I think that's usually a pretty good way to do things. Stories can really get bogged down if you have to tell your main characters entire stories right from go. It's a lot of uninteresting screen time to dedicate to characters we don't even know yet, and for stories like this where their origins are very important to events that are happening, that's information you very much have to get across. So doing it spread out like this to keep things moving into present, I think was a very good move. There's even some really decent metaphorical writing in here, nothing too crazy, because if it was too crazy I probably wouldn't get it. So wait, maybe there is some crazy stuff in there then. Anyway, there's the obvious one where Edward retells the story of Icarus to the church girl, where he and his brother are obviously stand-ins for Icarus. They flew too close to the sun in trying to revive their mother, and now have to live with the results. Unfortunately, the show makes that one really even more obvious than it already was later in the same episode, and it's like, come on, man, let me think I'm smart. Stuff like that, and little moments where Alphonse has those moments where he's afraid he's a fake soul in a tin can, and a toy robot hits his feet, and then a kid runs up and grabs it. In that moment, that's how Alphonse feels. Is he just a puppet? a plaything for his older brother, or is he really him? There are really some deeper themes present in this show than most of the other anime schlock I've come across, and a lot of it ties into the story very nicely. There's this theme of transhumanism. What is it to be human? Alphonse is just a soul bonded to some armor, but Edward insists he's still a human. And then you have the crude chimeras, which, well, I guess that counts. I remembered going in that some real deplorable shit happens to this girl, but of course I did. How do you forget something like that? Anyway, they must be human on some level, right? That girl is still in there, somehow, some way but is being human on some level the same as being human? And then the more advanced chimeras are basically completely human, but with advanced features from animals that are incorporated in them somehow. It's much easier to call these ones humans, but how much more human than the dog girl? Does it matter? Is being human just looking human? Or is being human having a soul? And that's where homunculus has come in. They're clearly far removed from being functioning humans, but they act like us, they speak like us, they have flaws and wants like us. Where's the line? What is it to be human? And I think that's that's a very interesting question the show poses, even though it hasn't zoomed in its focus on it very far as of yet. And while I love this theme, I really, really wish they gave Alphonse more time to grapple with it. The question of whether he's real or not is posed to him, and it clearly bothers him, but then that episode ends, and we only get about half an episode of Alphonse trying to wrestle with the idea. That's a big question. That's not something you and your brother reminisce memories over, and then you're just over it. At least I don't think it is. I thought it was very selfish for everyone to get mad at him for blowing up over it. Like, okay, Edward, I'm sure you feel bad 
about it too, but dude is a voice in a can of Campbell's chicken noodle soup. Let the dude be mad about it. He's pissed. I'd be pissed too. I wouldn't know if I was real either, but oh, Edward sulks off because he's the one that feels bad. Like, be there for your brother, man. He's struggling. And what are you even crying about anyway, Winry? Get real. I would have much preferred if this question was one Alphonse had to struggle with over a longer period of time, because honestly, sometimes he can feel like a bit of a tag-along. He helps with all the studying and little things here and there, and he's good in a fight, but a lot of the time it just feels like he's following Edward around. Him having a big, hard question like that no one can answer for him would have helped him feel like he had more to do in these opening episodes, I feel. Even outside of themes and characters, I find the pacing of the show to be pretty strong as well. It may be a touch slow in places, but you're constantly drip-fed little bits of information about really important stuff. Who are the people with the tattoos? It takes 13 episodes to learn it, and across them you see small moments of them doing some real evil villain shit, but you eventually learn that they're homunculuses. What's going on with the war that happened? I don't know, but this Scar guy seems none too pleased with it. Sure hope he doesn't explode anyone's brain again two episodes from now. Philosopher stones are clearly a thing, and someone has access to them, and may even know how to create them, but a lot of the information is kept strangely in code and behind a lot of red tape. And when they do find them, why are the ones they find seemingly still very powerful, but prone to breaking? And who's their dad? He seems like a big deal, and then a way bigger deal right as episode 14 closes out. Is he even Edward's dad? I mean, he's built like a brick shit house, and Alphonse seems to be well on his way, being a year younger than Edward, but Edward's built like a straw piss shack with abs. And that's not even to mention the god they saw. What the hell is that thing? Why is that there? What is that even? Where is that even? Why does it work on a toll system? Why does it seem to mirror the person it's speaking to? There are all these wild unanswered questions that you constantly learn just a bit about as the story moves forward. And having all these questions, and then also a story that is actually moving forward at all, seems pretty impressive on its own. So a bit of slow pacing, while I can and will bitch and moan about it, can be overlooked once in a while, I believe. In the middle of the season, an episode here and there, it really does get too slow, though. There's an entire episode where they kind of just hang out in some mechanic's house and deliver a baby, some character stuff here and there, but very slow. There's an episode where they're just chilling in a hospital after a fight for the most part, when Alphonse has his two-minute Pinocchio crisis. There's an entire episode about them looking for some dude's notes, running into an anime character, and then trying to decode those notes. I know some of these elements are going to be story important, but they can also eat up a lot of screen time for a show you're just starting out. Outside of these episodes, though, pacing, not bad. Ooh, ooh, I just randomly thought. Remember when Alphonse gets his memories back of being mind cratered by God, and for some reason he has this flash from the point of view of the horrible zombie corpse they created? So I figured that means that that was actually Alphonse in that abomination, rather than the spirit of their mom. It's revealed in these episodes that making a philosopher's stone takes multiple human sacrifices, and I know this isn't the same thing, but I take it that means Alphonse was accidentally used as a human sacrifice, but being only one human, it wasn't enough to make an actually effectively living thing. So it wasn't really their mom, which I guess is better? Like, I'm sure they wouldn't want their mom to be in that state under any circumstances, so I'm sure Alphonse would have gladly tanked it if he had the choice. Anyway, my dumb theory out of the way now, let's circle back around to the voice acting and secondary characters. The main voice cast, for the most part, I think is solid. Edward and Alphonse, I think, do a great job, like I said, but everyone else puts in a good performance. The important ones, anyway. Smaller characters and one-off villains put in performances, but really nothing to talk about. Which I guess makes sense, they're not the stars of the show, who cares? The Fuhrer is really hamming up his nice guy act voice-wise, but that's kind of the point, so I think the voice performance does its job. But man, anyone with the title Fuhrer? You're on the back foot here, dude. You're starting from behind. I already don't trust you, and my sharp intellect has proven me correct once again. Mustang's performance might be the one I'm most critical of, except Lust. It's not that it's a bad performance, or even that it's missing something character-wise. All I can tell about this dude so far is that he's a very serious military man that wants to climb the ladder. He literally just wants to be king and catch Scar, which will hopefully advance his military career so he can become king. So for a character that has so little going on at the moment, I guess I don't really expect a blockbuster performance. I got my eye on you though, Roy. I feel like some of the dialogue for the secondary characters is less cared for as well on some level. It's all pretty solid, but then sometimes you get lines like this. I understand why you think you have an advantage over a man like me, since I possess neither your impenetrable <laughs> ultimate shield nor an ultimate spear that can pierce any substance. And I think some people actually really like the it's a terrible day for rain line. I don't know, man. It just strikes me as very goofy for such a somber scene. He's at the grave of his dead friend. 
friend who died in the line of duty, leaving him on the other side of a phone call as he bled out. A lot of very complex emotions tied up there, I'm sure. So the tears, I understand, but a hammy line like this? I don't know. This scene, though, is actually what made me think of the Edward's emotional journey plot, though. All these manly military men openly crying, and Edward seems to refuse to. At least outside of Joke Point Five's chibi cut-ins. Hughes is a bit of an annoying anime character. My definition of that term is that it's a character that often extremely over-the-top displays their one character trait, this time being that he loves his family. He's basically the avatar of Joke 3, but anime falls into that trap a lot, the idea that just slapping an adjective on a character is enough to make them a character. It's the worst one it bleeds into not just being annoying to the characters, though, and it actively annoys the audience. And Hughes can very often flirt with that line. For the record, I think his voice actor does well, I just don't have a lot to say about him. There's an interesting through line with Hughes, though. In that episode where the girl and the dog get fused together, horrifyingly, the show always has a bit of an off-putting tone when it comes to that doctor guy, which is good, you can tell some real sideways shit is about to go down, despite the girl being overly loving and happy. And I'm not sure if they meant to do this, but I get the idea that there may have been some sort of through line between Hughes's overly loving attitude and the girl's overly loving attitude that made me feel like some real sideways shit was gonna happen to the Hughes family at some point too. It's a very different outcome, but of course still devastating. Hughes is mostly fine, can be annoying. Okay, seriously, is it just me or did anyone else think Hughes and this greed guy were the same guy in the opening? I mean, come on, look at them. I thought there was gonna be some twist that he was some weird leather-skinned monster man. Then I guess you've got Vegeta All Might, who, if Hughes was the avatar for Joke 3, he is the embodiment of Joke 3. He can sometimes have a quiet moment, some might say introspective, seems dutiful to a fault. But moments always seem to give way to him ripping his shirt off and the rest of the cast going, wah. And I get it, bro, crazy gains. If I looked like that, I'd want to be showing them off too. Lust sneaks into this list because she recurs pretty often and isn't a slobbering dog person. I know her name is literally Lust, the sultry, I'm going to jump on the next thing I see with a pulse voice is the point, but there's just something I don't like about it. It doesn't work for me. It seems cheesy almost. Scar puts on this gruff voice all the time because he's really serious and tough and tortured, and I believe he's all of those things, but the performance might seem a little one note in the face of the better performances in the show. I'm not sure. You don't see a whole lot of him in these first episodes. He seems interesting though. The war, his retribution, he even had a run in with the homunculuses. Man, I hate saying that fucking word. He's a character that has some intrigue to him rather than just the plot, which makes me like him more than I probably should should so far, considering how little I've seen of him, and how much work the show has put into him. Finally, let's wrap this all up with the action. This show perfectly encapsulates anime action done correctly, if you ask me. I was already kind of falling off of anime at the time, years ago when I stopped watching it, but the thing that literally made me stop was the action, or should I say, the fake action. The fake action where characters stand around and think in their head what's going on in the fight, what their next strategic move is gonna be, how strong their opponent is, their motivation in a fight, and then cut to their friends watching them and commenting on the fight. All of this as they just stand there, not fighting. And then after the next small interaction where some animation and some fighting happens, we have to do it all over again. It's crazy when you notice it's happening. You ever watch that Netflix show Bo- You know what, never mind. I'm bleeding into a video I want to make eventually about the adaptation process from page to screen. The action in these episodes do not have this trouble. When it's time to fight, they fight. Sometimes they stop to talk, but it's never just fluff time filler. They're talking about plot important beats, moving the story forward. And then they get back into it, and I call that a pretty major distinction. Sometimes it falls into the traps internal dialogue about, God, I'm losing too much blood, I need to end this fast. But it's appropriate, it fits. It doesn't slow things down just for the sake of slowing it down. And it's all choreographed really cleanly as well. And choreographed might be a silly word to use there, but seriously, that's what it is. Most shots are steady and last and capture multiple quick but very clear shots being thrown, and either landing or being blocked, no bullshit, no cuts, no slow motion, real action. Which I genuinely appreciate in an action cartoon. Only very rarely does it evolve into something you can't follow on the first watch. These feel like fights, not just two characters showing their moves to each other and taking turns. Can you tell I bring a lot of baggage into the animated action thing? Is it obvious yet, or blindingly obvious? The overanalyzer in my subconscious constantly asks questions during the fights about how the magic works, or couldn't they just do this or that, but 14 episodes in, I can't be too mad about it. I was basically just delighted. Edward seems to lose a lot, which I think works better than other shows I've covered, with the main character having that happen, because when Edward loses, there seems to be consequences. He loses potential information, or is laid up for a while, and at the end of the day, he's not this super-powered god or anything. He's a skilled young alchemist, but it's not like he's the best to ever do it, with the highest skill ceiling ever. So the couple of times Edward loses in these episodes, it doesn't make him feel weak, it makes the villains feel dangerous. And you're not gonna believe, I'm actually gonna be pretentious enough to tie this into the characters of Edward and Alphonse. I like that their bonding activity is sparring with each other, or really fighting, it seems like it's serious enough that there's a winner and a loser at least, which I feel pairs really nicely with the fact 
that their biggest problem is losing parts of their bodies. That feeling, the physicality of a fight, is what brings them together as brothers. So that's it, final decision. The opening was good, and yeah, I bet you like the show for real. Quickly before the patrons, if you're just finding my channel, I talk about shows kind of like this all the time, so if you enjoyed this video, check out the rest of my videos and maybe you'll find some stuff you like. Secondly, if you want to see more of this content, obviously drop a like, comment, do all that good stuff. Fuck, watch the video twice, I don't know, it's your life. If this video does well, maybe we'll do other shows, maybe there's more Full Metal Alchemist in the future, who's to say? For anyone freaking out about this video, don't worry, there's more core on Patreon already, we're doing season 3, chill. Okay, patrons time. Patreon shoutouts, if you want to see my next two videos ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons. A stack of pancakes who got a steel big toe grafted onto their foot just in case they ever stub it. Ben Mizra who just made up the Roman Empire one day and everyone's been believing him for so long he's afraid to tell anyone it's not real. Donut who can guess the combination on any lock as long as it's either all letters or all numbers. He don't fuck with that hybrid shit. Gene Cree who has a record setting 205 secret shrines glorifying them in people's closets. Kevin Bartlin who has a remote control that can mute people. He hasn't used the power switch yet so careful. Liquor cause I know her who landed a four story drop on one leg. Omega Fighter, who kept the electricity going to a hospital for 14 hours by keeping a treadmill powered generator going. Tater of Tots, who can take the raw components of a muffin and then after combining and heating them, can commit grievous bodily harm to an attacker with them. And that one Turian, who made the first fully sentient AI out of Lego, and that thing's building some really troubling shit. And of course, my other fuck you money patrons Blanco, Jammin, Luna Invicta, Lurfax One, Matthew Lang, Potato Scream, The Former Meaning of Life, The 1 AM Party, and Whitrow. And my god overanalyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, and Alan Garvin, Andrew Jacobson, Andrew Watrett, Oropitaro, Axolotl Syndicate, Bob Def, Carlo Wren, Chandler Crump, Charles the Fartbender, Kobe Smith, Deathly Healer, Dr. Xerox, Dominic Saint, Dricker, Emma Not Emma, Aaron Grace, Fire Lizard 44, I'm a Match, Jason Gebhardt, Jackson, Jeremy Rubenstein, John Ajaka, John Warhammer, Justin Scott, Mac, Medium D Speaks, Michael Fellin, Mitchell Gobrek, Nick, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Pogger White, Rocket Mist, Ryan Gregorikos, Ryan Maxwell, Sandy Stormborn, Shane Antonacci, Silk Toast, Smarty Marty, Spicy Ketchup, Super Sniffer, Thomas Barrett, Von Can't Spell, and then there's some sort of bare face. Next up, eh, probably some more Cora.